Well, hello, everybody. Thank you for, for coming. It's uh, been a pleasure to be here. Um, very friendly place. Uh, everybody who came to help us out at the charrette um, was uh, very caring about the city. Uh, we may not have agreed on everything, but everybody wanted the best for the city. We had um, all kinds of people come in from staff, from business people, from residents. Um, people wandered in. Uh, we, we took a tour. Um, thanks, for Chris, for showing us around, um, and, and Jonathan and Liz for our walkabout. Um, we got to see a lot of things. We, have, we had current staff and we had retired staff come back. So if, there's, if the retired staff are coming back, that's pretty cool. Um, so we got a lot of, about the history of, of the area, um, and we got a lot of uh, aspirations about where we want to go in the future. And what Ken and I did, um, was we, we listened on Monday during the tour and on Tuesday during all the what we call stakeholder interviews when people came in and, and talked to us. And on Wednesday we had a, a few more um, interviews and we did a pin-up Wednesday afternoon with some of our starter ideas that we, that we did on, on Wednesday morning. And then um, last night, early this morning and then <laughs> early again this morning, we drew up our thoughts and we slam them into this PowerPoint, which none of us have seen yet. I haven't even seen it, because um, we literally put it together as we ran across the street. Um, so we're going to go through that together. Uh, it's going to start with um, a little bit of background, because we just don't want to launch into uh, restoring the one-way streets back to two-way right away. There's a, there's a whole bunch of um, overlapping issues that I think um, need to be thought through a little bit, and then things become clear towards the end. So there'll be a, a couple case studies, um, and then some theory stuff, and then we'll get into the meat of what's going on here, um, and, and some of the potentials. Now, keep in mind that everything you're seeing is literally a starter idea. These is to get the discussion going, to, to challenge some conventions that have happened. Uh, nothing's um, done. In fact, I don't think very many People from the city, whether you live here um, or staff, have even seen what we've done yet. So this is like fresh. So that's what we'll do. And um, let's see, is there anything else? Preliminaries? I think that's about it. So we we'll launch right in. Um, <coughs> so we, we did a tour. Uh, we drove around. We walked around. We, um, we got a, a kind of good flavor of of the city. Uh, we, we experienced some of the one-way streets and, and how, they, how they felt and how they kind of evacuate the city at, at, um, at the end of the day. We saw some of the issues crossing from the east to the, to the city, some of the walkability issues. We saw some um, uh, interesting bicycle behavior on the sidewalks. Um, we saw some dangerous situations like kids riding the wrong way um, on some of the bike paths. Maybe it's because they couldn't cross the street. I don't know why they're on that side. Um, that fantastic amenity you have um, with the river. Unfortunately, it's, it's hard to get to. You only get to it in a couple of spots. We'll, we'll go over that in a, in a minute. Uh, what's going on up towards the, the universities? And then we had lots of meetings. Um, people came in and shared all sorts of um, thoughts with us about what the problems were and what the opportunities were. So here's, uh, here's our pinup. Um, uh, lots of people showed up. It was um, good feedback. Uh, and by the way, I just wanted to add, I just recalled, um, we're not starting from scratch. The city's actually done quite a bit of work already um, thinking about this. Uh, DLZ, one of the local engineering firms, have done some good work laying the groundwork for what we're talking about. And they were helping us as well during the charrette. And, um, and so we're kind of taking it from, from there with some, some other ideas. We also, also looked at the history, and so this is um, one of the old plans for the city, and, and Lafayette and uh, Colfax, I think is the name, of the two of the key boulevards. The Lafayette one goes right up to um, uh, Leaper Park. Um, Colfax crosses the river. So before I get into you know, more about South Bend, I just want to tell you a little bit about um, the West Palm story and a couple of other case studies. 
About 20 years ago, I got hired to lead the transportation division in the city of West Palm Beach. And um, when I got there, it was a highly challenged city. My predecessors had one way to and sped up all the roads, uh, making them pedestrian unfriendly. Uh, people started leaving the city. A uh, mall got built outside of town. And, and the fashion was to get folks in their cars through and out of, and in downtown as fast as possible. And over time, it, it degraded the public realm, the streets, and, and everyone left. And they get, became car dependent and then started driving back. And we started tearing down our fabric buildings to put in um, surface parking lots, which degraded the, the city some more, which created more flight. When we hit rock bottom, everyone who could had left the city. We had 80% vacancies on our main shopping street. The city had $7,000 in reserves. The, the drug and prostitution problems in the city were legendary. Uh, we always talk about HBO doing their, their um, documentary on drug abuse. Uh, Undercover USA Crack America was filmed in downtown West Palm Beach. So we were, nothing was going on. There was no development activity at all. So something had to change to attract people to come back. This is where the people went. This is called the Everglades. And that's what happened to the Everglades. You, there's all Everglades, and you just uh, dig up the dirt, pile it up, build houses on it, and have waterfront property. Um, and then, they, then they, they all had to use these roads to get into town. And the same sort of thing might have happened around here, but you probably built on farms. So folks left, became car dependent, and, and started devaluing the city by their expectations of, of driving through. This is the figure ground of our city, and you can see the dark spots are the buildings, and all the empty space is um, parking lots are just vacant property. And we did everything we could to promote the, um, the cars driving through. And this is how vacant the place looked. You know, just all boarded up, um, empty, kind of desolate place. We still had congestion, though, because we had 30% of the jobs. People would come in, only, even though we only had 8% of the population. So we did a vision. We came up with an idea of how we wanted our city to be in the future, just like you're doing now, talking about where you want your city to go. <clears throat> so it's not really just about restoring the two-way operation of the street. It's about creating a great downtown and a great city. And we drew what we wanted our, our public realm, our streets, to look like. And then we codified it um, so that we had some regulations to back it up. So my job was to make the streets nice. And so this was a a four-lane commuter route um, cutting through one of our neighborhoods along our waterfront. And what we did with it, we turned it into a two-lane street with lateral shifts and connected all the parks on the waterfront with a, a linear park, um, kind of a shared path thing. This is a state arterial that was blasted through one of our communities. It was a five-lane speedway devaluing everything in its surroundings. And we turned it into a two-lane um, contributing street and we raised the intersections that the two elementary schools along the way to help the kids cross the street safely. So they cross at sidewalk level, and the cars have a little ramp that they go up, over, and down. Um, this is uh, another state arterial one-way street uh, heading into the downtown. And we two-wayed it, narrowed it, beautified it, put in street trees. This happened to go through a college. and so. The college was going to put uh, those concrete pedestrian flyovers over the street because it was so hostile. Instead, we made the street pedestrian friendly, and we put some raised crossings to help the students get across the street. Uh, saved tons of money and uh, added a lot of value to the city. This was our, um, our main street. And it was a one-way street with signals. There was turn lanes at the end. And we, we two-wayed it, uh, beautified it. At the end, um, there was a, a big intersection with signals and turn lanes. We took out the turn lanes. We raised, it, raised the thing up to sidewalk height and, and made it beautiful and became a place. And people started coming back. This is where the, the drug dealers and prostitutes used to hang out a lot. We put in a fountain, a little interactive fountain for the kids. Um, it's interesting. You build a fountain in a place where there's lots of drug dealers. The kids show up and the parents show up. And then the drug dealers all go away because they, they don't like to be observed. And so this really helped clean up that area. We put places for people to sit. Uh, we gave facade grants. This was a vacant building. And we, uh, we gave the, the fellow the money to fix up his facade. And he, he figured out all by himself to fix up the inside. And now there's a, a waiting list to, um, to live there. 
Now, this is the corner where the prostitutes used to hang out. Now they can have a nice lunch at the restaurant. <laughs> and then development started happening. Um, there was this feeling of predictability uh, that West Palm Beach was coming back to life, and people started investing in built big mixed-use buildings. And here I am narrowing the street at the same time to make wider sidewalks and put in street trees. We, uh, a grocery store came downtown. And then we started working on our waterfront, and what we wanted to do was connect all the parts together. And this was a big state arterial that went and, and cut our park system in half. And so we built a little bridge under the big bridge. Um, so, the, so we have wheels and heels, cyclists and inline skaters, and the walkers go under the, the bridge. And we did a little interchange. So you, can, um, you go from the arterial road down on, under the bridge. So you're completely connected for walking and cycling at that bridge. This is something that you can, you can do up at Leaper Park, perhaps, or other places in the city. And we terraced it so that d for fireworks and so forth, when you're at the bridgehead, you can sit and enjoy what was going on the river, just watch the boats go by. For ambiance, we actually brought in some full-size oak trees to, to give it some place right away, and um, uh, put some bike racks and so forth. This is, in, this is where the heart of Crack America was filmed. We saved that old high school, and now it's a fantastic performing arts high school. It's going to get torn down. And we, we did the public realm, and the private sector did the, uh, uh, the blocks, and we did a mixed-use development. So that was the outcome. So if you look back there, this building is this building. So we got a mixed use of buildings, and, and so I, did the, I had to do the streets, and the the model said we had to have left turns here, but it was so important to make it walkable that we chose not to do the left turns there and um, tightened it up. And just like the model said, we have a little bit of congestion here, but nobody minds. It's such a cool place. Um, once you drive into here, you just want to get rid of your car and start walking. And that's what happens, and it's a very vibrant place now. And then we did this little trolley to help you know, rattle around the downtown to help uh, shrink the downtown. And so we, have, we had a whole series of before pictures like this that turned into nice after pictures. You know, a completely vacant place turned into a vibrant core. And the reason is because we got our basics right. And that's what, that's what we're um, talking about here, getting the fundamentals right, the, the streets two-way, the sidewalks the right dimensions, and this sort of thing. This is Chattanooga, Tennessee. Uh, we did a project along the waterfront. This is Riverside Parkway. And the city wanted to reconnect to its water. And you can imagine the same sort of thing um, here. Um, so we did a, a, a vision of a two-way, two two-lane street with parks and trails. <coughs> now the, the Tennessee DOT said the lifeblood of the city is the highway and that, that folks needed it to get in and out of the city. The city was saying, no, walkability and access is important. Trails and so forth are important for the social health and the economic health of the city. So these two completely different paradigms um, struggling over what should happen on the waterfront. This is the aquarium. So they, they did all what we call the silver bullets. They brought in the big aquarium. Still didn't get the fundamentals right. Still didn't result in the economic um, changes that they wanted. But we eventually prevailed. And there's the street under construction. This is opening day. And then years later, there's you know, all kinds of events and all kinds of things going on down by the waterfront. Nobody can imagine the highway there anymore. It's just become a really great place. And you've got your little park in front of the theater, or sorry, your, your plaza in front of the theater. And, and perhaps something like that with a terrace can, would make sense. And, and, and folks love it. It's added a tremendous amount of value to the city. So you know, whose paradigm was right? You know? So you get the, the basics right, good things can happen. This is Trenton. I'm showing you um, waterfront cities because of the, um, the parallels. But this is an old Olmstead Park along the waterfront, uh, along the Delaware River. There's the state capitol buildings. A lot of historic uh, infrastructure here. And the New Jersey DOT built this highway right through the park and these, put in these surface parking lots, which devalued the city and, and, and pulled the value out to the suburbs. Um, so. We worked with the Department of Transportation, the Corps of Engineers, the, the state, the governor, the, the planning department, everybody, on removing the highway and re replacing sort of a um, high
high-speed type environment into a connected network of multiple streets at a much slower speed. And uh, it's through feasibility analysis now, and um, hopefully uh, it will get built sometime. So there's the block structure. And, and this, is, this is kind of an interesting corner that we're showing, because I know you've got some uh, clover leaf, clover leaves on your waterfront, too. And so this is part of a big Chinese checkers game about redeveloping downtown Trenton. And there's the big highway that's, that's getting removed. And it's going to be replaced with the boulevard network of streets. And that interchange will get replaced with something that's more city friendly so we can get a mixed use development. So instead of a scene like this, which is um, along their waterfront, they're going to get a scene like that. So just a little bit about theory. Um, once your street is improved, the curb will be here. So I think we're taking a different tact on what improvement means. So we're going to try and improve the, the downtown for everybody. Um, pedestrians, motorists, shop owners, um, office workers, everybody. So here's some ideas. Uh, streets is public space. Scott mentioned that earlier. Um, streets have been monopolized by motorists for a long time. They still have to use the street. It's very important that they, they still have access. But we need to do a better job of accommodating the, the, the walkers and the cyclists. We call those the mobile street users. But equally importantly, we have to support what's on the sides, the institutions, the housing, uh, the businesses, the recreational areas. We call those the static users. And, and when you combine these two groups, they're, they're vulnerable. And so they're very sensitive to the uh, environment on the street. So we're, we're trying to soften that environment and, and um, advance the utility of the, the green and the red groups. My profession, uh, traffic engineers, defines the capacity of street of, as how many cars can cross a line in an hour. I think we all know that streets have the capacity to create great addresses, to nurture businesses, uh, to create identity, uh, to be recreational facilities, um, social spaces. Streets have all sorts of potential that, that, um, that's often untapped. If you're trying to predict the, order, uh, the orbits of the planets and the Earth is in the middle, like we used to think, uh, it's very difficult. You always have error. However, if you assume the sun's in the center of the solar system, it's fairly easy to predict the orbits of the planets. When you're designing a city, if the car is the center of your solar system, it's very difficult to get a great city. There's always, there's always issues. But if you put the human being in the center of your solar system, the car is still important, but then things start to make sense, just like the, the orbits of the planets. Things become simple, particularly in your downtown. From a scale perspective, cities and downtowns forever have been designed to a, a human scale, and more recently, to a, a motor vehicle scale. And, and the idea is to pull some of that uh, back a little bit. <coughs> Streets need to be connected, a connect network of streets, and same with the open space systems. Does anybody recognize what that is? Okay, it's a horse, right. Has anybody actually seen a horse skeleton? <laughs> but you know it's a horse, right? Um, how about that? It's a, it's a slow moving mammal. It's, it's a manatee. Now both these animals have the same ingredients. They've got lungs and brains and kidneys. They both are warm-blooded. They both eat grass. But their bone structure makes them into completely different animals. One runs around, one floats slowly. Cities have different bone structures, different cities. They all have offices. They all have the same ingredients. They all have parks and housing and so on. However, this city is highly walkable. Um, if there's a collision here, nobody notices. Uh, this city is completely car dependent. If there's a, if there's a crash there, it shuts the whole thing down. So depending on the network, you can get completely different outcomes um, for the city. Anybody know where this is, by the way? Savannah, very good. Anybody know where that is? Yeah, who cares? <laughs> like, <laughs> so it doesn't really matter, does it? So there's lots of different ways of connecting um, cities. And it a lot of it depends on the topography and that sort of thing. 
So the idea of a connected network of streets, it's really hard to cross big fast roads like you experience in your downtown, but a, a smaller network of small streets is like climbing stairs. It's kind of hard to cross or climb big stairs, but little stairs, normal stairs, it's not so bad. From a throughput perspective, this is kind of important when we get into more of the analysis part of the presentation. But um, here's a through lane and a left turn lane. So when you have just a through lane in each direction with a left turn lane, the through lane can carry between probably 850 cars an hour to just over 1,000 cars an hour, depending on cross streets and so on. If you add an extra through lane, the marginal increase in car carrying capacity of the second through lane isn't, it, it's not double this, it actually goes down. Um, and then if you add a third one, it goes down a little more. So that all, all lanes aren't created equal. You're a lot better off with several two lane streets with left turn lanes than a, a large multi uh, lane street with left turn lanes. Furthermore, there's Lots of different ways to turn left here, and only a couple over there. Lefts are always the, the, the trick in, in downtowns. And it's more walkable. So you have a pretty good network in your downtown. The idea is to, to use it to its um, fullest. Small blocks. Um, small blocks inform the scale of development. Um, they, they're, they're walkable, they're permeable. Uh, big blocks usually result in more car uh, car scale development. You know, this building is a good example of a, a, a super block, which, a, which is a fairly uh, car oriented. With a dendritic sort of sparse network, the um, tendency is all the trips to use the big road. With a connected network, there's multiple routing options um, available. Spreading loads out and creating what we call direct trips. And so you're more likely to be able to walk or cycle, all else being equal, in the network on the right. With a connected network of streets, in this, this example, uh, at, at streets were added to this situation. So the, the five minute and 10 minute walk contours to transit um, create a situation here where you capture a lot more land with a connected network of streets. So it's, it's transit friendly, but if you have a, a restaurant or a park, that too has a larger capture area within a, a five and 10 minute walk. Slowing streets down, making them comfortable. It's really important. These, these streets are the same width, but one has street trees and the other doesn't. So one feels uncomfortable and the other feels very comfortable. So getting street trees in is, is, is crucial. It has all sorts of environmental and uh, business benefits as well, but it, it, just, it just feels great. You know, providing facilities is important, bike facilities and sidewalks and on-street parking. But making it comfortable for people to use, to create an engaging um, set of storefronts to protect folks from the weather through awnings and street trees is important to, to create um, the ability for folks to walk longer dis distances. And, if you, and the idea is this in, in, to engage folks. And, and if you can get rid of the, um, what we call the missing teeth, you know, like you've got a lot of surface parking lots and, once you walk up to a surface parking lot, it kind of kills the energy of the street. And, and it's kind of like a, a missing tooth. When someone smiles and they have a missing tooth, that's the only thing you notice about their smile. You know, you don't notice all the other nice teeth. And so when you have a, a nice street and there's a surface parking lot, it'd be really great if it could be held with a building um, to create that really nice engaging street front, just like, a, just like a smile. Getting from four lanes to three, which is kind of the heavy lifting in this effort is hugely important from a safety perspective. With the four lane street, when you have two lanes going in the same direction, there's, there's a tendency for some drivers to weave. You've probably all witnessed that. With the three lane street, you tend to have to go the, the speed of the driver in front of you. When you're turning from the left through lane, um, it, in the four-lane situation, sometimes the oncoming traffic actually blocks your view of other traffic. With the three-lane, with the left turn lane in the middle, you don't have that problem. If someone is turning left with their indicator on, the person behind them slows down and doesn't have their indicator on. So the person behind them doesn't know they're turning, and so quite often you find rear-end crashes, unlike the three-lane section. And then there's the speeding issue, which um, I think we've all witnessed 
in, in the city. And then when folks are parking, there's a tendency to change lanes. And somebody, some other driver might be in the, the left-hand lane when someone's parking. Here, chances are there is no one in that lane. Um, and you can get past the parked car. And then lastly, when you're turning out of a side street, there's a, it's a little more forgiving because you don't have to have a gap in both directions. Um, and then the space that gets re recycled can get reused into uh, bicycle facilities, for example, which is one of the big strategies we're going to be looking at. Some places you have some big blocks. They're not too many, but you do have some. And three-lane streets that lend themselves nicely to uh, mid-block crossings with refuges. And then when you do look at cities that have done a lot of this, the safety statistics are compelling. You know, anywhere from 28 to 60 percent reductions in crash rates. So that's, that's pretty significant. And then when you look at cities from all over the place who have done this sort of thing, and look at the numbers they're talking about, they're higher than on what's in your street. So there's some cities with quite significant traffic volumes doing this sort of thing quite successfully you know, all over North America. There used to be a time where every street operated at the same speed. Um, the big arterials, the collectors, the locals, they all operated at four to six miles an hour, which is how fast your horse walked. The horse didn't really care what street it was on. It just walked. And um, consequently, uh, pedestrians could cross the street, uh, housing could be up to the street, retail could be up to the street. So our big arterials were fantastic addresses for social and economic exchange. But as in more modern times, as we sped up those big streets, um, they became uh, less friendly for the pedestrians. Retail didn't want to be there anymore. Uh, certainly the housing didn't want to be there anymore. So we find ourselves in a lot of older places slowing down the streets on purpose to reverse some of those trends. If you um, study traffic engineering, you'll find that you can actually move a lot of traffic at um, fairly low speeds. So um, at 25 to 30 miles an hour, you can move you know, quite a bit of traffic. The other thing we're uh, learning, this is out of a, a, a guidebook, um, is that the operating speed, the design speed, and the posted speed in cities, and particularly in downtown, should be the same. So if you want drivers to drive 25 miles an hour, design the street for that and post it at that. And so it used to be thought of as a factor of safety if you designed a, a street for 45 miles an hour and then posted it lower that it was safer. But lo and behold, people with speed, and then it wasn't safer. So I think we've learned better, particularly in the downtown, to, to match those things. And there's all kinds of guidelines from the Institute of Transportation Engineers, the CNU, different DO departments of transportation, um, different cities with lots of guidance on this sort of thing. So there's no shortage of, of support and, and cover for, for doing this sort of work. <coughs> walkability. Um, everyone talks about walkability. They want their, their, their cities to be walkable. But what does that really mean? Do you ever read those personal ads? Um, people looking for a, a life partner, a, a lover. They always say, I like to go to movies, I like to laugh, and I like to walk on the beach. And um, why do people like to walk on the beach? Uh, three things. So apparently beaches are walkable, because um, everyone loves it. So, and they're really simple, right? You've got the, the beach, the water, the sky, and some backdrop. Not very vibrant, but people love it. They have three ingredients. They're comfortable, the people feel at ease on them. Uh, they feel safe. They're engaging, they can sustain one's interest. And they're accessible. The people using the beach can actually walk on it. Now cities need more than that to be walkable. So here's a waterfront in a city. Cities need two other ingredients to be walkable. They have to be convenient. So that means what people need on a weekly basis, on a daily basis, is close at hand. And that's kind of a land use question. Uh, housing, shopping, entertainment, all that kind of thing needs to be close at hand. And that's what you're doing now. I think you're getting a lot of housing and stuff in your city. And then connected. And this gets to what we're talking about today, about the streets. You need a good network of streets. And with two-way streets, you have much more connectivity, access, better wayfinding than you do with one-way streets. Now in a downtown, 
that's not enough. There's still a little bit more that you've got to do in a downtown. It needs vibrancy. So you have to do all those five other things really well. Oops. And the idea is, if you do that really well, the average trip lengths get shorter and shorter and shorter. And a lot of those trips, the shortest of the trips, become walking trips and bike trips. And that translates into vibrancy. And that's the sort of the transportation engineer's way of saying a cool place, <laughs> you know, the short trip lengths. Um, so that's what you want in the downtown. This is Richmond, Virginia. Back in the day, it was a hugely vibrant place. Tons of trips. See, my profession talks about trips and volume, and we, we often get them confused. You want tons and tons of trips in your downtown. You want that vibrancy. Um, volume something else. That's just the number of cars on the, on the street. You can have um, 10,000 cars on the street, and another city you can have 10,000 cars on the street. If the average trip length in the first city is 10 miles, and the average trip length in the second city is half a mile, the second city is 20 times more vibrant than the first one. It's got 20 times more trips going on. Same volume, way more trips. So here they've got lots of trips you know, and, and whatever volume is there. Now through, so the, so the litmus test is the short trip and the transit trip. That's what, that's what cities need to support, particularly downtowns. This is a map of Richmond. Um, these are the trolley lines. Uh, so everybody was within a short trolley ride or walk of anything they wanted. So here's Broad Street today. This is the same view, same, take, taken from the same spot on the street. And there's no vibrancy. There's plenty of volume on the street, particularly in the peak hours. Very few trips. They have two university campuses in their downtown. It's the state capital, and it's a miserable downtown. Uh, just look at it. And, but look what it was. So there was a series of changes on that street which rewarded the long trip, the automobile trip, and penalized the walking trip, the short trip, the, the, the slower trip. So they kind of blew it <laughs> in their downtown. Low impact design, um, just quickly, there's a lot of movement towards uh, reducing stormwater runoff and that, and there's all kinds of technology about impervi or pervious paving materials and um, rain gardens and this sort of thing. And, and there's, there's lots of opportunities in what we're talking about today to, to help from an environmental perspective. On-street parking. We want to talk about back and angle parking. Some people call it safety parking. Right now, you've, you've got three choices. You've got parallel parking, you've got 90 degree parking like on Michigan Street, and you've got head and angle parking. But let's uh, explore this fourth option for a second. So how you do it, this is, just happens to be an informational sign, is you you slow down and you back in, it's the f and then you stop. And it's the first half of a parallel parking maneuver. So it's, it's actually quite easy to do. It takes about half the time. So here's, this is in Washington, D.C. They've had this in place for probably 20 years now or so. And there's a guy backing in. Look at that. He did it. There. He's in the space. Uh, easy to do. Uh, even SUV drivers can do it. Um, not hard, but when you leave, you can see. So this, this car, or, th or this car, even better, can actually see past that minivan. Um, and that's where the safety comes in. When you head in angle park, you're backing blindly up. When you have 90 degree parking like you have on Michigan, you're backing up blindly, which isn't very safe and it isn't very bike friendly. Now this happens to be on a busy arterial road in Seattle, and it, it works really well. This is kind of cool if you notice that on one side you've got the back and angle parking, on the other side you have parallel parking. Next block up, it switches. And so what they've done here is they've created these lateral shifts on the arterial as part of their effort to keep the motorists going a little slower. When you load, you load from the sidewalk, not from the middle of the street. It's bike friendly, it's, it's compatible for bike lanes. You can do it on hills. Now, when you open your door, your children are, si are channeled to the sidewalk. With head and angle parking, when you open your door, the doors actually block their way to the sidewalk. Uh, it's friendly in, in mixed-use places. Fleets do it because they know it's safer for their insurance. 
Uh, this is on a highway. There's no way you could head an angle park or even parallel park on this ro road. And I can't remember where that was. But anyway, they, wherever that is, they, <laughs> they do it there too. <laughs> so it takes about 16 feet. So that's 16 feet to about here. <coughs> and everyone talks about the dreaded um, uh, situation with the, the backs of the cars facing the sidewalk about all the pollution that comes out of the pipes and stuff. And, and that hasn't been an issue where it's been put in. Some cars have the pipe on the, or particularly pickup trucks have the pipe on the side. So um, it seems to work fine. A universal design. I think there's a, a movement to be more inclusive in our street design for people with um, mobility impairments or wheelchairs or pushing carriages. So here's in your, this is Europe. This is a, it's called a shared space. You park, you walk, you bike, everything in that one space is just paved from building to building. You couldn't really put in sidewalks and stuff. There's not enough space. So this rather formidable looking woman can walk down the middle of the street with that car behind her and everything's fine. Um, here's another shared space. This is at an intersection. You can see the students here um, working on their phones and smoking. <laughs> And the old lady's walking across the street, and everything's fine. The cars circulate. Uh, now, this is a wider street. They could have put in sidewalks, parking rows, trees, bike lanes. Instead, they, they, they built it like this. And so you still have parking and cycling and so forth. But it's a, uh, it's a very equitable space. And when you do before and afters on safety, crash rates go way down. Um, retail sales go up. People really like this sort of thing. And if you ever wanted to close the street for an event, uh, you've got a, a fantastic space for it. Here's an intersection that got retrofitted. So they did a little bit of art in the, in the middle. There's dining on the sides. There's some um, guidance through paving materials to help folks navigate in their cars. Uh, but it's a, a much uh, nicer space. Here's a, a really complex intersection with approaches coming from every direction. These tall things are just for um, lighting at night. And it's got some art and dining areas. There's no crosswalks. There's no signals. There's, it's on a major transit route. And it works better than it used to. And it used to be highly engineered. You know, where you cross, how you time, how fast you go, where you park. It was all thought through in an office and then implemented on the ground. This is a completely open space with no guidance whatsoever. Um, and it relies on people's human sensibilities to, to negotiate through it. And the this had plenty of crashes, and this doesn't. It's far safer and um, working quite well. So there's the transit going through. This is what it looks like on the ground. So it's a pretty dense place. Um, and don't tell me they don't want to go fast here. <laughs> um, but the environment says go slowly. And people go through carefully and slowly uh, through that downtown quite, quite well. This is in. Um, Scandinavia somewhere, so you know they get snow, so they, somehow they figure that out. This is in England. This is a fairly new application, and this used to be a very conventionally designed street, very busy street, um, and now it's a, a shared space. So we're doing some of this in North America. This is a before picture and an after picture. So there's no curbs in this street. This is um, this is another shared space that just recently got built, um, and what we did here was we. Again, just took away all the sidewalks and turn lanes and all that kind of stuff and just made this sort of plaza space. And usually you have what we call comfort zones on each side. So there's, there's places where the cars can't go, where people can walk comfortably. Uh, but you're, you're licensed to pretty well walk anywhere you want. And it's all part of an economic redevelopment strategy. This is the University of Central Florida, um, 50,000 students, big university. This is their main shopping street. There's the residence halls. But notice there's no curbs on this street. And what we were going for here was there's a lot of people who don't get out much because they, they have difficulty. And this guy and this student in this wheelchair can now get anywhere everyone else can. Um, and it, it helps everyone else too. You don't, you don't have to trip over curbs yourself. This is up in uh, a college up in um, the downtown in, near Toronto in a, in a cold city, snowy city. Same thing. It's a flush environment connecting two open spaces together on the campus. This is uh, by a big basketball arena in Orlando. And there's, notice there's no curbs on that street. This is right downtown. This is what it looks like at night. It's a very beautiful space. 
And then when it's closed for an event, you've got this great plaza. So it's used as a street during the day and for events at other times. Bicycle facilities. This is called a cycle track. It's really great along waterfronts to have a two-way uh, bike track. A little tricky at um, signalized intersections with, um, unless you're along a waterfront or something. This is a trail. You know, you've got bike lanes, just shared streets, um, the, the multi-purpose trail. Roundabouts, very friendly for cycling and, and pedestrians. This is a bike lane. There's a, another bike lane. <laughs> There's a concrete bike lane. The nice thing about this is it, it's conspicuous. You don't have a line to maintain. The trouble with this one is you, it's every joint you get a little bump on your bike, which is kind of uncomfortable. However, this one has uh, saw cuts, so it's very smooth. It's very much smoother than the bricks. Uh, very successful bike lane on that street. And then there's um, protected bike lanes. So this is the bike lanes on the, the friendly side of the trees, and then at intersections it comes out to join the intersection. Here's one um, in Cambridge, down at MIT. So the bike lane comes out here and joins the intersection. This is on the other side, it, come, it goes back and then behind the parking. So this is something that we're thinking maybe on Main Street over time, if the street were ever rebuilt, something like that. This is on an enormous um, street that we're redoing in North Bethesda. You see this huge boulevard with transit in the middle, but the bikes are on the, other, on the friendly side of the parked cars, and at the intersections, they go through like a, a normal bike lane so that the drivers turning right and left can see them. You know, very safe, comfortable environment, appealing to a much greater uh, potential bike population. Mixed use densities. Uh, hello, mixed land use and density reduced my average weekend trip length by about 85%. So this guy has everything he needs close at hand. And that's what we mean by mixing your land uses so you don't have to go very far in your downtown. So this is what we do in, in travel. About 20% about of our trips have something to do with work. 80% have something to do with other things. So if we can get these other things in or close to our downtown, people don't have to go very far, and you can convert a lot of long trips into short trips. The last sort of idea is about transect and context. <coughs> in cities, you expect taller buildings closer together. And in the rural areas, you expect them really far apart. In suburbs, something in between. You expect more pedestrians and, and less as you go into rural areas. In cities, regularly spaced trees and grates. Forests in the rural, rural areas. Suburbs, something in between. Pedestrian scale lighting in the cities. Cobra heads in the suburbs. Probably dark. Probably no lighting in the rural areas. Better quality paving materials in cities more formal edge treatments in cities, slower speeds in cities, higher speeds in rural areas, middle, middle speeds in the suburbs. You expect formal parking on street in the cities, off street parking in the rural areas, informal parking in the suburbs, and you expect wide sidewalks in cities, trails in the rural areas, and maybe five foot sidewalks in the suburbs. So we're talking about downtown. The design vocabulary for downtown is on the left side. If you're working in a rural area, the design vocabulary is over here. What we have to really be careful about is importing rural ideas and suburban ideas into our downtown. Look, look at the scale of some of the lighting downtown. Clearly, they're kind of suburban scale. Look at some of the speeds um, and the, the, the widths of some of the sidewalks. A lot of your sidewalks are nice, nicely wide. Some aren't. Um, parking. Uh, parking is really important. So, so when we design, think about this edge. So that's part of the, uh, the, the um, context. But there's all kinds of other things that come into play, which we learned about on Tuesday and Wednesday. But probably the most important thing is the vision, uh, where folks are, are wanting to go. And we think of vision as sort of a um, kind of a collective uh, idea about where the city ought to be, I ideally. And then what we like to see is a plan on how to achieve the vision. Otherwise, it's uh, just a pipe dream. So if you want to attract um, business and people to the city, you need vision and predictability. A big idea, a, way to, a direction to go, and then a plan. I think you're well on your way with that, with this effort that the city's done already and, and what we're talking about now. So consensus of where the city ought to be, and then some way to advance the vision. So here we are. 
There's a few before and after pictures. So this is the after picture, and there's the before picture. <laughs> uh, there's the after picture, I guess the now picture, um, and there's the before picture. It's kind of neat that there used to be two theaters and a, uh, and a, and a trolley line. This train used to go out to the airport. Can you, can you imagine if you could get that back? Wouldn't that be cool? Um, you had trolleys. Look at the vibrancy. All kinds of activity going on in the city. Again here, look at the uh, nice um, pedestrian comfort on the edges. Again, very vibrant situation. The city used to have parades. You know how hard it is to do a parade in a city with one-way streets? Because if you do a parade, it, it kind of just shuts the whole thing down. With two-way streets, it, it doesn't. And there's a, a postcard of what the city used to look like. And, you know, before all the um, streets were one way and all the surface parking lots uh, followed. It used to have uh, very few missing teeth in, in its fabric. And there's in front of the theater. Now, these are people, by the way. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and there's the after picture. Um, so what was a real great place for people to gather has been turned into a, a kind of a highway conduit. And then, um, uh, same further south. Here's a uh, sort of a base map of the city, and those are the buildings. So it's, it's not nearly as bad as West Palm Beach was, but you can see there's um, plenty of surface parking lots that have crept in where the, the fabric was. Parking is important, but perhaps it could be configured differently. And then that's the open space systems. And, and if, you, if you think about what's actually accessible to folks, uh, this has a, a privatized edge along it with, with this building we're in now, and um, or effectively privatized. And then the offices, the yellow is the housing, which tends to dominate those waterfronts. We have really two um, opportunities. Hunt, is it? The Hunt Plaza area. And then up there at uh, Leap, Leaper, Leaper? I'll learn all the names eventually. Leaper, the Leaper Park area. So those are the two big opportunities to engage the waterfront at the moment. And these are the one-way streets that were put in. Some, some are kind of confusing of why they were put in, because they don't, you know, it goes two-way, then a little bit of one-way, and so on. Um, so the, the key is to try and restore those and, um, and still allow the, the traffic to, to get around. There, everybody we met, um, over the last few days, wants a, a much nicer downtown, a walkable downtown. We didn't hear a lot from the people who just cut through. They didn't show up. Um, but they'll probably write a letter once all this changes. So what we've done is we've gone to great lengths to look at the traffic volumes and see how we can rearrange things so that folks can still go through, but on the downtown's terms. Right now, they're kind of going through on some kind of highway terms. The, the thought is that they can still go downtown, but it's more like guests as opposed to just uh, some kind of dominating force through the, through the downtown. <coughs> so if we look at the lanes, up at the bridge, um, there's four lanes crossing the bridge. Down by the hospital, there's six. If you add up all the lanes through here, there's 13 through lanes. And then um, towards the south end of the downtown, there's 12. That's uh, important. Um, in a moment, <laughs> because if you take the, if you take the, if you look at the AM traffic counts and the PM traffic counts, and you take the highest volume either going northbound or southbound, this is what you get. So if you add up all the traffic on all those lanes, this is how much much you have. Now the big strategy is if we can divide those traffic loads amongst these streets to get them um, smaller. So if we could um, take those same numbers and divide them by, let's say, three and a half here, these three streets in, in Michigan, which are only counting as a half because it's low volume, uh, divide the traffic amongst these three streets. If we can get the through traffic down to those numbers or, or, or split to those numbers, then all of these streets will function perfectly adequate with one lane going in each direction with left turn lanes. Do you remember we, we did that slide where it, the volume on a through lane was like 850 to just over 1,000. These are all less than that. So if we can divide the traffic up, the network will carry those, those loads and then some. 
But the trick, of course, is up here, because everyone has to cross that bridge. So it's very difficult to get traffic to get onto Lafayette. It's, it's sort of um, biased towards to, to Maine and, and Michigan and St. Joe. So if you, if you look in the other direction, the southbound, the same kind of thing. If the, if the, if the current traffic loads get, get divided between the network, the network could handle it fairly readily. But again, it doesn't because it, it's concentrated. So part of the big strategy is to spread the loads. At the end of the day, if we could spread the loads, this is the lane configuration that would be, would be good. Two, um, two lanes on Williams, um, and then two lanes with left turn lanes on Lafayette, uh, Maine, and St. Joe, and then on Michigan, two lanes. And that way we can um, shrink the size of the, the travel way and recycle that other space for things that help the downtown, like wider sidewalks, street trees, on-street parking, uh, bike facilities. And we get all those other safety benefits we talked about before. We also get, but with the two ways, nice, easy wayfinding. You don't have to go past your destination and so forth, and then double back, that kind of thing. Our bike strategy is, you'll see in a moment with the cross-sections, but to put bike lanes up here on, on Michigan, around about here to split the loads between um, Michigan and Maine, and then have the cyclists, um, you'll see some cool bike facilities in a second, up and down Maine. But this, um, this roundabout would, would allow the two-way traffic to split um, evenly um, between those two corridors. It, it's not enough, though, to get the cars to get over to Lafayette, so we have to have another idea for that. At least we can split the two-way traffic here. And then to, to start to engage um, Michigan a little bit, we're thinking of um, a little roundabout down at the south end. And then we have a, we're going to go into this in detail, a, a, a really cool idea to, um, to get a little bit of traffic to start using Michigan um, instead of all of it on, on this corridor using St. Joe, and a, a reimagination of the, the plaza area. This is... Um, this is another big idea. This is um, Leaper Park. And right now, people use the west side. Very few people use the east side. And part of the reason is because Michigan is such a barrier between the two. And part of our, our bike strategy is to start getting trails up and down the, uh, the waterfront. And so with a roundabout, we can actually connect the trails together. And kids, cyclists, and so forth can cross between the size of the park uh, fairly readily. And then what we want is, uh, once you're in the roundabout, it doesn't, you're kind of indifferent which approach you leave on. And there's, we have all these land uses down here which are conveniently accessed by Lafayette. And so folks could come down and use Lafayette. The rub is that it, Park Lane, I think it's called, um, this facility, this, this new, this, um, I guess you could call it a combined street. Uh, Riverside is over here, uh, Park Lane is here. What we've done is we've, we've put the two streets together into one um, right here. The idea was to better connect the park to the waterfront was one idea, because right now the, the street kind of cuts off the water from the, the, the majority of the park. And then to allow um, a portion of the traffic, instead of all coming down here and then migrating to the west, could use Lafayette and go directly to their, their land uses. And, that's, and it's helpful for the, the whole downtown, but it's really helpful for the, the hospital because a lot of their employees park here. Um, it actually saves them time from an emergency response perspective. And I think it kind of respects the historic plan of making this into more of a boulevard, which, was, which I showed you at the beginning. The school, which is a landmark school, every, everything by the way here is historic or landmark. Um, uses a street for uh, pickup drop-off. So we've, we've created a, we've turned that street into a, a school-oriented pickup drop-off. Anyways, that's a big idea to, to distribute the traffic from Lafayette and then down here to Michigan and, and Maine. And in that way, now, we can equitably distribute those loads uh, between the, the three main corridors. And then we have um, some east-west thoughts. Um, was it Jefferson? was rerouted over here to Wayne, which causes a lot of wayfinding confusion and so on. And, and there's some pretty high speed behaviors through here. 
So what we were thinking was that that four-lane road could turn into two two-lane roads, which would carry, actually carry more traffic, and um, and use two streets instead of one, which has some advantages. The the conference center has a couple of, of loading facilities here and their parking lot. So what we were thinking in there was perhaps that street could reconfigure into some kind of um, more of a kind of plaza type street so that, that those functions can still happen. And then um, Martin Luther King, it comes in and, and has a peculiar set of intersections that result in a one-way street system on um, Marion and Madison. And we think um, Marion could just be the the street and, and just let that be, become a two-way neighborhood street again and just simplify those intersections. Um, and then lastly, this isn't something that needs to happen anytime soon, but what we would recommend is not precluding these connections over time as, the, as this area redevelops. So when designing this roundabout, make sure that you can get a fourth approach on it some days. So you can have the buildings and then a more of a rational block structure down there. So that's the totality of the, the thoughts in order to make the two-way street system work with um, volumes that allow you to recycle a, a lot of the asphalt into contributing uh, space. So let's look at what some of these streets might look like. Um, there's Williams. So it has a 70-foot right away. That's about what it looks like right now. And with paint and maybe a couple of you know, relatively inexpensive um, tree installations, it can convert it into a much nicer uh, two-way street with um, left turn lanes. This is uh, Lafayette. And that's what it looks like now. Um, again, just with paint and a, a few bulbos, it could, um, it could change into a, a very nice uh, street. This is Michigan in the um, kind of the core of the, the downtown. This is what it looks like now with the 90 degree parking. With, um, with back end angle parking, we could uh, put in some bike lanes in, in, that are safe to use um, and, and bulb outs at the end of the street. This is Maine. Um, this is what it looks like now. Uh, this is one option that you could do in paint with a few, a few bulb outs. It's wide enough that you could put back and angle parking on one side and then parallel parking on the other. And then we would also recommend switching the sides like you saw in Seattle. That would make a very nice main street at a pretty low cost. And then if you were ever to rebuild the street, it could be something like this with the um, protected bike lanes that are on the friendly side of the parked cars until you get to the intersections and then they, then they come out. And then you could have a kind of an arterial bike route, if you will, uh, feeding the entire center of the city and then going up through the roundabout, up over the bridge uh, to places further north. Then we looked at um, Leaper Park, and there's, um, this park is steeped in, in history. It's uh, part of the original imagination of the area. None of the plans we looked at were actually um, built according, you know, purely according to the plan, so there's, there's variations of it. Um, this is the more recent one, that's, which reflects a lot of what's there now. But I think there's some really important principles and some very uh, important uh, historic resources that need to be thought through and respected. This, this is the, the rethink of this space will require uh, a lot of sensitivity to the, to the history and um, to what was there that was taken away for maintenance reasons and other purposes um, and, and how this can serve the community in a contemporary setting but respecting its, its history. And we found all kinds of imagery of what it used to look like. There's the pond with the little island, and there's some of the rose gardens um, back in the day. There's one of the little bridges. That, I think that one goes out to the island. So there's the park. Um, there's the kind of barrier through it. Um, and so there's, there's one idea. So what we did is we took all the plans we saw and kind of combined them, um, knowing full well uh, that this will not be the plan, but it's a starter idea um, that's going to require involvement of you know, at least the, the school, perhaps the hospital, the historic preservation committee, the, the parks uh, folks, um, the community at large, and so forth. 
But the idea was that there's, there's that entry feature that we talked about coming over the bridge, um, allowing the distribution of the, the loads. This is the, the, the bike path that now can connect the whole waterfront together you know, across the splitter island. The, um, the idea is to, to allow for a waterfront crossing as well under the bridge, knowing full well that sometimes during the year that won't be available because of water level changes, but this one will be. Yeah, we've created a few views like, um, that aren't there there now. This street points to this beautiful structure. Going the other way, you can see this, the beautiful uh, pumping building. And this would be the, the school's pickup drop-off facility, so they're, they remain uh, whole at the end of the day. Um, some of the playground equipment could probably be switched out to being more inclusive and um, helping kids with disabilities without um, being um, obvious that, that that is, that all kids can use this park. We, we reimagined the, the formal plaza setting that was in all of the plans, uh, kept, kept the pool. So if you look at those plans, you'll see a lot of this in them. And so we just um, adjusted them you know, to restore the, the rose garden and, and some of the trail systems. Um, we didn't put some of the water features back. We made this into a flexible play area because the water features tend to take a lot of maintenance. And we turned it into more of a formal sculpture area like this. And anyway, that's just a starter idea. But the, the point is that the, the four-lane street could become a couple of two or three-lane streets and really reduce the barrier effect um, in and around the hospital area and this park. Um, probably the coolest thing is that this street is not here now. So there'd be a, a much a stronger relationship of the park to the, to the waterfront. Both sides of the park could get used. Um, so anyway, it's a starter idea. Um, we were. Our, our focus was, of course, the two-way streets, but um, we also do park planning, so we couldn't resist <laughs> looking at that. But this is a way to sort of um, get that discussion going. And then um, there's been a lot of thought already about um, the, the plaza downtown. And like you saw in the, the drawings, this is one of the few places that folks can actually get to the waterfront if it were not for that, um, that road. Now, one of the local architects came up with a, a cool vision of just taking out St. Joseph and restoring the park and uh, had a lot of good principles for the park design. The, um, the issue of just taking the street out is it creates a, what we call a confluence where all the traffic on Michigan and all the traffic on, which one's this one? Colfax, um, have to share this link, which makes this infeasible from a, um, strategic perspective, because if we did that, then one of these whole streets would have to be four lanes. So if we could avoid that, then this starts to become feasible. And um, so we came up with an idea, taking his um, initial thoughts and evolving them with uh, a few thoughts on traffic. So there's um, Colfax, there's St. Joseph, there's the, the beautiful theater with its um, uh, plaza up top. And there's this kind of cliff right here. Um, and you can only really get to it properly down there. So the, the idea that you're going to see is that we, we're, we're going to try and create a plateau up top that's um, usable. They can have those crowds show up that you saw earlier. And then a little plateau at the bottom. And our thought is to move the street over towards me uh, with some terracing that folks could use to um, actually view the water and have access to the water. So that's, that's how that turned out. And I'll go, I'll just, this, again, total starter idea. There's the little plateau at the bottom. There's a much larger plateau, kind of ends here. This is the, where the hill is made up. Um, there's some spaces for stopping to get tickets and so forth, the dining area. Um, now the, the interesting thing about this intersection, this intersection, that intersection, and this in all the streets in here, there are no curbs. Uh, this whole thing can be closed for events and become a giant plaza that's totally barrier free. Because you have two other two-way streets in the evening and on weekends, those two streets can carry the whole load of the city, freeing this up for public events. Right now with the one-way street, that's impossible. 
So this gives you a, a waterfront park, uh, waterfront plaza rather, that you can use um, for all sorts of things. <coughs> Notice there's a, a, a lack of trees and stuff right there. And there's a lack of trees and things right here. Notice there's no stage. What we want to do is allow this plaza to be used in many, many, many different configurations. So you can go there as a couple and, and just hang out at the chairs or in this little tiny plaza on the hill or sit on the, um, the terraces. You can go there with a party and occupy a larger space. You can have a city event there, like I think it's Friday Fountain something. I don't remember what it's called. But you can still do that. You know, there's large spaces for that sort of thing. You can have major city events and use the whole plaza. Or you can have July 4ths and, and go from face of building to face of building um, and use that entire plaza. So you can see right at the edges, these are those ramps. Remember the school I showed you? where it's a raised intersection, that's what these are. Uh, that's what that is. And once you cross those ramps, it all becomes uh, universal design. And um, you can literally put a stage right on top of here, or here, or here, or here. Or you can put a barge out and put one there. So you've got an immensely flexible space. The way it's designed now with all those vertical elements and so forth, it's um, kind of hardwired for you know, five or six different configurations. Um, this sort of thing has uh, a lot more potential. So the idea is that um, there's St. Joe going up into to Michigan. Um, we did, this all had to get tested out, but we did a, just a stop control here on, uh, on Michigan. Notice the nice use of materials. Um, we do, however, recommend just ordinary uh, brushed concrete on the sidewalk so folks aren't tripping. This is an ADA friendly ramp all the way down to the waterfront and eventually beyond in both directions. And then there's terracing with stairs. So anyway, this, there's probably a hundred ways of designing this, but this is one idea of, of achieving many goals simultaneously. So that's the upshot of the whole plan. And um, I guess that's all we have. <laughs> so thank you very much.